Hello, everyone. Welcome. Hello. Welcome to the to, to our Citrus uh, Research Seminar Series. It's a it's a great pleasure to welcome you and our speaker today, who's a who's a friend and a, a colleague and very interesting mind. We want to welcome everyone who's out on the web and all, at all the other campuses. Hello. Thank you for uh, for tuning in, and we want to also mention that this series is going so well that we're also starting another, two new series. We're going to have one that's going to be on um, uh, ITS, transportation topics, um, and trust. It's going to be focused on resilience. It's going to begin on March 19th, so that's coming up, and there's going to be another one that's going to be around the topic of robotics, which is going to be a new initiative within Citrus. Uh, it's still top secret, but um, stay tuned. You're going to, that's going to be announced in uh, April. I also want to mention that on uh, um, March 21st and 22nd, there's going to be a hackathon, specifically around these kind of topics that we're going to talk about today. This is a, it's called Hack for Congress, and it's a multi-city hackathon to solve, I don't know if they're going to solve this, but it's addressing congressional gridlock. Um, and so we're, we're the co-sponsor on the West Coast, and it's related to Code for America in San Francisco. So we have information on that um, if you're interested. Again, just search for Hack for Congress. There's going to be um, a censored journalism webcast series uh, with Open Knowledge Cast. That's going to be on weekly Sundays at 5 p.m. Pacific. Uh, details are on the Citrus homepage. And then the last thing is that, Cit that the Foundry is co-hosting an event called Talk and Q&A with Y Combinator. Um, at Cal. So Y Combinator, everybody knows, super premier, uh, top, top tier um, uh, startup organization. They're coming up um, Friday at 7 to 8 p.m. right here, and there's going to be a Q&A and talk, um, and this is a chance to meet the, uh, the, the people who run Y Combinator and maybe get yourself accepted in the future. All right, so with all that, uh, now I have the pleasure to introduce uh, Michael. Mike, and he is, uh, he's, a, he's, he's an amazing colleague. He has his uh, engineering degree from Tufts and an MBA from Harvard. He came to Berkeley to run a, um, um, run our, our intellectual property um, office. And I had personal experience there. I was involved with that from, for many years. And when Mike got there, everything changed for the better. He completely revamped, he brought in all this new energy, really changed the whole attitude and made this into a place that's super effective and, and, and energetic and enthusiastic and really changed the landscape. And for that, I just wanted to thank you for that. I think everybody should. Okay, so he does that, but on top of it, he, then he's also started all kinds of other things. He started the, um, uh, the, the, the Sky Deck. Um, startup Accelerator here, another thing called the Startup Cluster, QB3, East Bay Innovation Center, something called NetPulse. I don't know when he sleeps. I mean, he's just amazingly effective. And he's, he's organizing all these things. I'm very proud that he's a member of our uh, Data and Democracy Advisory Board. And, um, but on top of all that, he is very actively involved in local politics and really cares about it. And so with a, um, a physics PhD student, uh, Robert Vogel, the two of them started something brand new called Peak Democracy. And uh, what, that's what we're going to be hearing about today. And it's an amazing, amazing organization. And the technology they have is very impressive. And there, it's being used um, around, the, uh, around, the, around the country, around the world. And uh, so I'll let him describe it. But uh, please join me in welcoming Mike Cohn. Thanks, Ken. If I can log in here. Okay. Well, the, uh, the title of my presentation today is How Online Civic Engagement is Better Than Conventional Civic Engagement and Can Increase Public Trust in Government. And I want to preface it with a conversation that I had with my wife a few days ago, Professor Lisa Alvarez-Cohen. I told her the other evening, hey, I'm, I'm going to do the Citrus Talk. Maybe you might want to go. And she said, not if you're going to do a sales presentation. <laughs> so this is not a sales presentation. This is all about information technology in the interests of society, which is the Citrus mission. And because this is an academic setting, I'm going to try to integrate some work that, for example, Ken has done with his students in the Data and Democracy Initiative and some other academic work um, into this discussion. 
So with regard to the agenda, I'm going to start with a very just uh, overview uh, to give you some context on how this relates to uh, the Citrus mission. And then I'm going to go into the body of the presentation, which is how online civic engagement has advantages over conventional civic engagement. And that should take me about 30 minutes or so. If I go off on tangents, maybe 40 minutes. Uh, and then I'll leave enough time for Q&A. But also I invite you to uh, think about ways in which we could take this, uh, this technology, because um, this is a deep dive into a whole new area of Gov2.0 called online civic engagement. And uh, we have whiteboards of ideas of where we want to take this. It's just a question of where to focus first. So in addition to your questions, I welcome your ideas at the end of this discussion. Okay, so let's talk about context. Uh, the vision underlying this presentation is that online civic engagement will be pervasive across all government agencies. It's just a matter of time. Whether that's two years from now or 10 years from now, it's hard to uh, guess, but it's inevitable. And the reason why I feel so strongly about that is because we're seeing that online civic engagement can um, dramatically improve a government's insights and uh, interactions with its community, but that's if it's done well. And that's uh, part of the inspiration for this talk and this company, to do online civic engagement in ways that increase public trust in government. And that can be contrasted with a lot of crowdsourcing tools, or what some people now call clicktivism, because they're more optimized for activists or for selling user data. And they can actually backfire and erode public trust in government. Uh, here are the co-founders, as Ken mentioned. This is uh, another reason why this is relevant to Citrus, because this uh, company spun out of the uh, UC Berkeley innovation ecosystem. Robert was a, a PhD student in the physics department when I met him, and we started work on prototypes of this idea and eventually launched the company. Uh, in terms of the data underlying this talk, if I go to um, the company's website, you'll see that we've powered almost 2,000 of these online forums that have attracted over a quarter of a million people. And that's the, ref that, that's the, the data that I'll be uh, uh, using in, in some of the, um, the uh, conclusions that I'm making in this discussion. Uh, and here are, this is just a list of some of the, uh, the, the leading edge cities that are using online civic engagement. The ones in red are all uh, in California, most of them in Northern California, and about 40 of them are in the uh, San Francisco Bay Area. And one more uh, context point, uh, the company's hiring. So uh, all you UC Berkeley graduates that want to work in Gov 2.0, work on software that does good, uh, we're looking for uh, everything from sales and marketing to support and development. So uh, uh, you can send the company an email if you want. OK, and that's my um, uh, context. Let me move now into the, um, the body of the presentation, how online civic engagement has advantages over conventional civic engagement. One thing that I want to clarify is that I'm not advocating that online civic engagement replace conventional civic engagement. We're merely saying that it can uh, nicely complement and supplement conventional civic engagement in ways, again, that can increase public trust. And that's my sub-theme, this notion of doing it in ways that increase uh, public trust. Now, for anyone that's really interested in that, there's a second presentation that focuses just solely on this topic. Um, and uh, you can send the company an email if you want to, to learn more about that. I'm going to pepper this sub-theme into the presentation because it is a key point. Okay, so let's get into the uh, advantages. Uh, I'm going to describe five advantages today. Uh, each one's going to have one or more live demos from county cities and towns across the, the North America. Um, I can pick from a variety of, of topics, planning, budgeting, policy, whatever. I can also pick from a variety of communities, all kinds of communities from uh, large to, uh, 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 counties to small townships, different geographies, and also very uh, different demographics. So for this discussion, I'm going to mostly focus on Bay Area cities, but um, just to show you that it's not a Bay Area phenomenon, I'll, I'll also include some, city, um, uh, some governments across the U.S. All right, so the first advantage. In comparison to conventional civic engagement, Online civic engagement offers much richer feedback. In general, public hearings are talk. But if you uh, look at some online civic engagement examples, you can see you can add photos, videos, or special mapping and budgeting tools. Um, and this richer feedback can improve government decision makings and thereby increase public trust in government. So let me give you some examples of this. Let's start with Morgan Hill. This is a city of about 60,000 in the southern edge of Silicon Valley. They're doing uh, uh, some long-term planning, and uh, these are some of the topics that they have online here. 
uh, preferred land use plan, a growth strategy, and then a, a survey. Let me pick one of these here. Let's go to the, uh, the growth strategy. <clears throat> uh, and if I go to go to topic. Now, one of the things that uh, you can see right away is the online civic engagement is a great way to educate the community in addition to getting feedback. So these are various um, growth strategies that the city is um, assessing. And if I go to post a comment, <coughs> first I can always just write something. I can um, add a photo or video here. But they also turned on this thing called uh, place type maps. So you can put, a uh, city can put whatever they, uh, categories they want here, and then they allow their community to, um, to place these on a map. So for example, this is residential infill. Let's see, I want residential, but first I'm going to turn on the terrain map. And then I'm going to put a location here, and then one over here. Actually, I'm going to move that to the, this corner of that lot. And then let's see, I, I want to put a neighborhood center over here. So let's uh, drill down a little bit, and let's turn on the satellite and get a little closer. I want to put a neighborhood center over in this uh, corner right here. And by the way, if I'm not quite sure about the location, I can move this peg over and then look at the spot online. And uh, yeah, that's the spot I wanted. Um, so this is this kind of information. Sometimes it's captured in shreds and workshops, but now you can do it all electronically. And then you can look at people's individual plans as well as the overall area plans for all your uh, community. This is, uh, we call this an inside dashboard. We make it available to the community as well as staff because it's important for that transparency to build public trust and also build consensus in the community. So you can see I can look at uh, individual plans. I can look at an overall area plan here. So that's one example of richer feedback. Let me go to another example here. So I'll move from land use to uh, budgeting. Budgeting. Um, this is Salinas, California, a little farther south from um, Morgan Hill. And they're doing uh, some priority-based budgeting. And uh, you can see they have two topics here, a, um, a quick version that takes about five minutes, and then a 15-minute version um, that's a little more extended feedback. So let me uh, go into one of these and go to the topic and uh, go to the uh, post a budget. So um, you can see in addition to writing something here and posting a photo or video, I can then go to this exercise here and say, how am I going to uh, allocate $500 across these priorities? By the way, take a look at their introduction here. And, um, in uh, Salinas, you can see it's um, a nicely formatted way to convey the city's priorities and sub-priorities in ways that, again, educate the community and help them provide feedback on what's important. So again, if I go to post a budget, and if, I think, for example, for um, effective mobility and excellent infrastructure, I'm going to put um, 100 here. And you can see this um, thermometer growing over here. And then for the next one, uh, Livable and safe cities. I'm going to put maybe um, 150 here, or 140. And um, so this is an interesting way to get, again, to get kind of people's feedback on the budget. And then if you go to the feedback, you can look at individual budgets. Um, for example, this is uh, uh, Lynn's budget right here. Uh, you can look at budgets average across all the communities, uh, all the, uh, the participants, and that's again another example of richer feedback. Finally. Let me show one other example here. Let's go farther south in California. This is uh, Encinitas, California. They're doing a whole housing strategy. Uh, and if I go to this topic, and uh, you can see what they uh, want is to, for the community to, to tell government staff where they think housing should be uh, provided across this uh, neighborhood. And so the, here are the locations in this neighborhood of Encinitas. And, um, so if I, for example, if I click on point one, uh, and then we have this, this uh, thermometer right here, and I say, okay, I think that I want um, mixed use, uh, small versus uh, this option here, so I'm gonna put a, um, a check mark there, and you can see the thermometer goes up, then I can go to site two, and then uh, maybe I'll, I'll put one right here, and so you can see that the thermometer is growing with each one. So again, an interesting way to get feedback from the community online, as well as in, uh, you can use this in workshops as well um, to get more, richer feedback. So that brings me to the second advantage that online civic engagement has over conventional civic engagement, and that is online can help you eliminate or mitigate undue influence in government decision making. Now, civic engagement has several common pitfalls. One of them, one category is called undue influence. And some of the, um, the sub-categories uh, uh, of undue influence are outsider influence 
activist influence and NIMBY influence. Those are the ones I'll cover in this presentation because they're very conducive to um, live demos. There's a fourth one called fraudulent influence, like gaming the system, that's key, uh, but I can cover that uh, either in the Q&A or um, offline with people. So first let me define these three types of undue influence. The first one, um, this outsider influence, uh, often on controversial topics, uh, feedback from people who don't live in the community or even work in the community can, um, can overwhelm the locals. Uh, but government wants to focus on feedback from its constituents and its jurisdictions. I'm going to give you an example of that in a moment. The second definition of activist influence, uh, this occurs when a, a set of people regularly participate in government forums, and their persistence <coughs> imbues these people with undue influence that isn't necessarily representative of the community. And that can erode public trust and then, uh, again, upset people. And then the third in this category is the, uh, the NIMBY undue influence. And that often occurs at land use projects uh, where there's a common pattern called NIMBYism uh, which can result in people near the project having undue influence that, again, is not necessarily representative of the community. So um, online has the advantage of a lot enabling people to register uh, when they uh, post their, their feedback. And that registration can allow you to gain insight into the outsiders, the activists, and the NIMBYs. Uh, and uh, by the way, we recommend that you um, have registration options so that you don't um, violate anyone's free speech rights or exclude people that want to participate uh, without providing their personal information. Uh, by the way, I used to be um, on the city zoning adjustments board, the city of Berkeley zoning adjustments board, and chaired it for a couple years. And I tell you, we use green cards, but um, they were often illegible. At least I couldn't pronounce the names or addresses, and uh, they were never authenticated. So that's not a, a, a comparable uh, tool in the um, conventional approach. So let me go to uh, some examples of this. Now, because of time, um, I'm going to have to use one city um, that happens to be a good example of all three influences. Uh, it happens to be a city that hosts a junior college down south here, but um, they were a um, they've been a very uh, early adopter of online civic engagement and also a um, uh, they prototype things, so it's been a strong partnership. This is the city of Palo Alto. Here's their open city hall link over here. Let's see if this comes up. <clears throat> I can see right now they're doing it. Uh, they just finished a topic on com uh, planned community districts. If I go to closed topics, you can see they've done a variety of topics on um, city council priorities for 2015. That's actually really interesting. I may come to that in the Q&A. Um, some other topics. But this topic that um, exemplifies all this undue influence, it's in their archives. And so you can see I'm, I'm logged in here, and since I'm a special user, this admin button mode appears. So I'm going to go into the admin system and uh, go to closed topics and show you this topic. Their um, art commission did a major design on a fountain in downtown Palo Alto, and it attracted over 6,000 online attendees and over 400 people participated. By the way, I went to this commission meeting, and only four people attended the public hearing. One of them was a prior mayor. So they were thrilled to have over 100 times more feedback online. So if I go to this feedback, this uh, topic, you can see here's the introduction. And again, it's a, a great way to educate the community. Uh, and these were three world-class designers. That's why it attracted so much attention. And if I go to the feedback, again, here's the Insight dashboard. Uh, made available to the community as well as the public. Let me f show you first this uh, search tool. And what this will reveal is that people from all over the country are participating. There's Berkeley, Brooklyn, New York, Chicago, Providence, Rhode Island, St. Louis, Missouri. But if you care about people just in your jurisdiction, if you want to uh, eliminate the outsider influence, you can go to the city of Palo Alto, do a search on that, and now you can limit your analysis and reporting to the 360 people um, that participated in Palo Alto. Now, Palo Alto configured this topic as a poll. So, for example, here's, um, here's Jennifer. Uh, she lives in the, um, the Evergreen uh, Park District. Here's her comment, and here's the, the uh, proposal that she liked best. So now if you go back up to the dashboard, you can see a tally of the, um, of the results. So here's the three proposals. And I can click on a bar and just look at the people that like the third proposal. But now I can also go into the maps. And again, look at now not only the outsider influence, but also the NIMBY influence. <clears throat> so this is first Palo Alto configured um, with an overlay of neighborhoods. And so you can see with my cursor outside of Palo Alto, I can see the results of the poll. 
But then I can look at every single neighborhood within Palo Alto, see the results of the poll, and I can then click on, for example, the old Palo Alto neighborhood, and just look at the feedback from this, uh, this area. And then, if you have a project that has an address, like most land use topics, you can also look at the feedback based on distance from the project. So again, now, this can help uh, reveal the NIMBY effect. So now here's outside of Palo Alto. Then using these concentric circles, I can go all the way to within a quarter of a mile of that, art, uh, of that um, found. Now look at the feedback within a quarter of a mile, and I can assess whether there's a, a, a kind of a NIMBY influence there. And finally, in terms of the activist influence, let me go to demographics. I'll show you more demographics in, a, in, a, in the next um, advantage. But uh, we can go to <clears throat> frequency of participation. And we can see that of the 419 people that were on this uh, forum, 20 of them had participated in over five other topics. So they're kind of like the people that go to frequently to public meetings, public hearings. And their feedback is valuable. I, I'm not denigrating it at all. You can see their, uh, their results of the poll. You can click on that. But now you can focus in on the 300 people that are newbies, that have never been to, uh, uh, participated, and they, so they can provide you with feedback that, again, can help you um, expose and eliminate, say, the activist influence from the, the people that, that, that don't frequently go to this kind of, um, attend, uh, participate in these kind of forums. So that's the second advantage. <clears throat> Let me move to the third advantage, <clears throat> which is better analysis and transparency. Online provides better analysis and transparency in, comp in comparison to conventional civic engagement. For public hearings, uh, beyond the nays, yays and nays, it's hard to analyze the feedback, especially in real time. Uh, but online feedback can enable very insightful real-time analysis and reporting, and uh, that can, again, um, help, especially if you make this available to the public, help increase public trust in government. So let me show you some examples of this. <clears throat> let's go, let's start moving across the country. This is uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma. And you can see they're doing some topics. Again, a lot of it's focused on land use. One of them is on visioning for their downtown, where they've had over 2,000 people come online, over 100 people post positions. By the way, that would be equivalent to a public hearing of over six hours if, it was, uh, if everyone was speaking for three minutes each. Uh, and then if I go to the, uh, by the way, here's the introduction with some nice photos. <clears throat> and if I go to the um, post a comment, <clears throat> You can see that uh, one of the things that they, actually, let me go to the feedback here. One of the things that Tulsa did is turn on this feature called support. So, for example, here's Matt, and he's in District 2. Here's his comment. And some people don't like to write a comment, but they'll support another person's comment. So you can see I can click support here, and then I can uh, log in with my um, social media credentials. And now we can look at the feedback based on uh, not just on date at which it was posted, but on number of supporters. So here's Amanda. She's in District 4. Here's her comment. She posted a nice photo, and she had six supporters. Now we can do something that Amazon.com made famous. They have a feature that says people who bought this book also bought these other books. Well, now we can see, using this uh, connected positions over here, we can see that people who supported Amanda's statement also supported these below it. And if you look at this in graph mode, it's a really interesting way for staff in the community to surf through hundreds of comments and find common themes and connections. So here's Amanda. Here's her comments. Uh, she, see she has a lot of connectivity with Anthony, so I'm going to click on his circle. I'm going to read his comment. Then I'm going to move Anthony to the middle of the circle and, and check his connectivity. So it's a nice way to kind of, instead of just moving through hundreds of comments serially, to move through the ones that have a common theme. Let me show you a few more analysis and transparency tools. This is Portland, Oregon. You can see right now they're doing a, um, a long-term strategy topic, but they did a topic on, um, on a transportation corridor in East Portland where they had about 1,000 people come online, over 100 people provide um, comments. Uh, and this is um, a budget topic. So you can use the budget tools not only for fiscal budgets, but also for project budgets. Uh, so if I go to the feedback, So, for example, here's uh, Brett Holy, uh, Holy Cross. He's a half mile inside that corridor. Here's his budget. Here's his comment. So I can look at um, individual budgets. And by the way, um, any member of the community can create a PDF or a spreadsheet file of it. So you never have another, another public records request again. The community has complete access to these. Um, 
because you, uh, you see the city of Berkeley staff cheering that. Uh, <clears throat> so you can look at individual budgets. You can look at budgets average across all the users. You can look at the budgets on the maps. This can be interesting. So here's a, um, a custom map, half a mile inside and outside the corridor. Of course, there's another overlay here on urban renewal areas. <clears throat> And uh, then we can also look at it by demographics. And you can put all kinds of demographic uh, variables here. Um, what Portland shows is age group and gender and frequency participation. So now for age group, I can see what the priorities are for the 20-year-olds, for the, the, the people in their 30s, and I can compare that. And for example, if I want to see what are the 60-year-olds thinking, I can click on that bar and just read what the 60-year-olds are saying. And you know, this can also include, for example, homeowners versus business owners, people that have second homes. In other words, communities can customize the demographics they want to analyze. And then finally, let's go to across the country to Virginia Beach. This is uh, what they call virtual town hall. I'll click on participate. And uh, they currently don't have an open topic, but they have one of the things that their portal exemplifies is they can you can structure uh, your online portals by department and by project. So for example, their finance department has uh, three topics, you can see here. Their parks and rec has a few topics, including a dog park. Uh, they did an initiative on technology, on the homeless, but their zoning department just uh, launched it one, their first topic on residential zoning for hens, not roosters. And they had over uh, 2,000 people come online and over 635 people post positions. That would be equivalent to uh, uh, over a day of public hearings at three minutes each. So let me go to that topic and go to the feedback. And so one of the, uh, the other analysis tools that I want to show you is this uh, real-time uh, clickable word cloud. So this could tell you what people are saying mostly, uh, and also if you want to say, what, what are people ta saying about dogs in the context of zoning for chickens? I can click on dogs and now look at the, um, the 62 people that mentioned dogs in their comments. I have time for, uh, let me show you one more example here. This is Palo Alto. Um, let me just go back to their city uh, hall uh, forum here. <clears throat> and uh, let's see, I'm going to get off, get out of the uh, admin mode. And uh, so now I'm back into a non-admin mode, and I'm going to go to this closed topic here. <coughs> and this city council priorities. So they had um, over 500 people come online, over 185 people uh, post responses to um, the city's priorities. If I go to this, uh, these responses and go to the summary, one of the things that the clickable, uh, the, the word cloud shows you is um, right away, just qualitatively, the top priorities, housing, traffic, Parking, and what's this about noise? So I go to noise here, just read about, oh, right away I can see that, um, they're, they're all um, upset about uh, SFO, San Francisco airports, traffic noise and small airplane noise as well. So again, these analysis tools can be very powerful. Uh, let me move to the fourth um, of the five um, advantages that online has over conventional civic engagement, and that is um, augmenting the number of people and diversifying the type of people who participate. Uh, many citizens don't have the time or inclination to go to these uh, public hearings. They're working, they're parenting. A lot of people with moderate views don't attend these public hearings. And um, online civic engagement can lower those barriers of participation. It can make it very convenient. But also, we're seeing that online civic engagement is um, leading a new trend in emerging feedback from face-to-face -face meetings into the online pl uh, platform so that you can use all the analysis tools. And let me show you a couple examples of that. Let's go to uh, Fremont, California. Here's their homepage. Here's their online civic engagement uh, portal. Right now they're doing some topics like on uh, e-cigarettes. But if I go to closed topics, they, their staff did a, uh, they're developing a, a, uh, their downtown and they wanted to create a logo for their downtown. So they, um, their staff walked around with tablet computers, put the software in what's called kiosk mode, and then on the tablet computer, they just, like, for example, in the farmer's market, they said, which logo do you like? Point, click, to, click on it, and then enter your email. 
And then through their email, they get an invitation to register and claim their comment at their convenience at home or at work. And that's how they were able to get all this feedback integrated um, uh, online. One other example here, uh, this is Vallejo, California. And um, here's, if I go to, um, let's see, there's their open city hall service. They do a lot of uh, planning and uh, budget topics. If I go to closed topics, they did a whole topic on ideation. And uh, ideation for a budget, they had about $2.5 million available for a flexible allocation. Let me see if I can find that quickly. Here it is. So about uh, $2.5 million, they had over 1,000 people come online, over 600 people post ideas. And one of the ways they were able to do this, to do this so effectively is their staff had these budget assemblies uh, in high schools and other locations. And um, they, ha they allowed uh, the community to fill out the feedback on paper forms. And then in this kiosk mode, they were very um, able to batch upload that paper feedback and then send emails to those people inviting them to participate. So now if I go to the ideas, you can now, um, here's the uh, idea browser. You can see different ideas here. If an idea was associated with, uh, with a place on a map, it has this icon over here, and now you can see it on, the, uh, on a map. They also turned on support, so you can see uh, which ideas had the most support. And they also turned on comments. So now this is kind of like a blog now, where people um, are commenting on other people's ideas. <laughs> so let me now move to the, um, the fifth, and final advantage that online civic engagement has over conventional civic <coughs> engagement, and that's showing that government can uh, integrates your feedback into the decision-making <coughs> process. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, here's some examples of that. Let's go to um, the middle of the country. This is uh, Eau Claire, Wisconsin, and they have this uh, service called uh, E2C2 for Eau Claire Electronic Conversation. And uh, they're doing a variety of topics, a logo for their police department. That's a fun one. Uh, but uh, and they're doing, um, they, they do a, an annual budget, uh, annual budget topic. And last year they did this budget topic. Uh, it's still open now, but let me go to the closed one from last year. And um, one of the ways it's uh, easy to provide feedback to the community is through uh, uh, the notion of an outcome statement. So this outcome statement is posted on the online forum, but it's also emailed to all the subscribers uh, in the community. So it's a great way to close the loop with your community and thereby build public trust in government. So you can see this, um, it's very simple. You just basically, the, the staff just said, thank you for your feedback. And then in this case, they, um, they posted a presentation that the city manager made to the council. And let's see if I can bring that up here. So here's the presentation. And they just simply uh, integrated the, uh, all the analysis tools from their online forum and I wasn't there, but I heard the city manager got a standing ovation because they never had this kind of feedback into their, um, into their, their budget process. This is, this is classic participatory-based budgeting and, and, and um, priority-based budgeting, and so that's an example of it right there. Uh, let me show you another example of closing the loop. Let's go back uh, to the Bay Area. This is Novato up in the North Bay. Here's their open Novato. Uh, they're currently doing a topic on a downtown bus facility on uh, Redwood Boulevard. But if I go to closed topics and just bring up, um, let's just bring up the top one, downtown parking, uh, and then go, go to the topic, and then go to outcome. It can be as simple as just a simple, uh, hey, thanks for, par for uh, participating. Uh, we're collecting your feedback. We'll, we'll let you know when they, we're in the next step, and here's the people that are listening. So again, it's not complex, it doesn't create a lot of staff time, but it's a great way to close the loop and build public trust. So uh, let me start to finish out here by saying that these advantages are, are being seen in, our, in the user survey that, um, that, uh, that users from the, all these communities fill out in advance uh, after they complete the, the form. And here's, for example, user uh, survey results from Santa, uh, Santa Ramon, California on the eastern edge of Silicon Valley. You can see that um, all the yeses here, that they like the service, and some of them, my favorite one, nice work, uh, good to see, good use of uh, taxpayer dollars. You don't see that too often. Uh, and then there's other ones here. This one's uh, it's a great way for people to participate that, um, that can't make it to city, uh, city council meetings. Let me go um, live to uh, an example of this. Um, let's go to, uh, this is Fremont again. This is kind of a diverse city. 
large city. If I, I'm gonna, uh, since I'm logged in here, I'm going to go to the admin mode. <clears throat> and I'm going to turn on reports. And you can see the satisfaction survey, 92% like the service. That's pretty good in government. And um, here's some of the, uh, you know, the S's. Uh, give me a platform to participate quick and easy. Uh, you don't want, this person doesn't want to go to boring city council meetings. And so again, people like online city engagement. It's a great way to, again, to, to make your citizens happy and build public trust. So um, let me say that if there are any government agencies out there, uh, either in the audience or on the web, um, if you want to learn more, uh, contact the company because the, the next presentation is on the top pitfalls and corresponding best practices of online civic engagement, again, in ways that build public trust. And these are these top five pitfalls. Um, registration restrictions, privacy and free speech, all the undue influence, including uh, fraud, uh, vitriol and bullies, overwhelming government staff, something called broken brainstorming, and then something called the referendum effect, which the mayor of Seattle encountered in 2010 when he asked the city for ideas and he had people vote on them. And the top ideas were legalizing marijuana and moving beaches. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, good timing. So I wanted to um, leave plenty of time for uh, Q&A and also just general ideas on, um, on where we might take this uh, in the future. Because this is, again, it's a deep dive into a whole new area of government 2.0. And, and um, the company and advisors have whiteboards of ideas where we're taking this. Uh, the, the roadmap goes for like uh, half a decade. And so um, any questions or comments? Thanks. Uh, I'm a public policy student at uh, the Golden School across the street. Right. My question, I want to focus in on the improve public trust uh, and kind of link it to accountability. I guess I'm wondering, uh, a lot of the analysis pages that you showed seem to be available to administrators. And even the Eau Claire and Nevada examples still would allow public administrators to frame analysis or feedback in a way that works. So my question is, mm. what's to stop governments from using the data they get to either reinforce positions that they had already planned on taking or shuffling feedback on ideas that they're not as interested in? That's a good question. One of the uh, things that the, the company has seen in working with local and um, all kinds of government agencies across the U.S., Canada, and now Australia is the, the difference in competency across government agencies. And uh, some of them um, are very sensitive to um, how they frame questions and ask for feedback in ways that they think are neutral and fair and uh, increase public trust. And others are not as sensitive. And, um, you know, that's something that um, just has to be developed over time. I mean, it's just, this is a platform and a tool, just like email. You can write a bad email uh, or you can write a good email. And um, that, that but your question is relevant to not just online civic engagement, but, but civic engagement in general. For example, at public hearings, when their uh, staff reports come out, what, what are the questions they're asking and how are they getting feedback? So it, it's, it's, a, it's a, a problem, it's kind of a meta problem that we can only help by educating uh, the community. But online doesn't necessarily do it better than conventional? Uh, not necessarily better, and in fact, um, if you don't do it well, that's one of the, the, the implications you can encounter this referendum effect. The referendum effect occurs when people in the community, when you ask them for feedback, and you don't tell them how you're going to use the feedback in advance, they often assume they're voting, and therefore the idea with the most votes should prevail. It doesn't matter if their feedback was statistically significant or representative of the community. And uh, this happens in face-to-face -face meetings and online. So, for example, on the ZAB, uh, we were, uh, so I see some ZAB people in the audience. When the, when the public hearing is one-sided, even if it's just 10 people, everyone assumes those 10 people proxy for the entire community. And if the board doesn't follow those 10 people, then they're not representing the will of the people. So that's the referendum effect in real time, and that also can happen online. And so when governments ask questions and ask for feedback, it's important for them to, um, to, to convey expectations. So, Other questions, Steve? I, I just had a quick question. I'm with the Center for Cities and Schools um, in the City Planning Department. Right. And uh, I do a lot of civic engagement of marginalized populations. And I'm just wondering um, how this plays out with diversifying or thinking about diverse participants. Language is a huge issue, you know, with Spanish in California. 
um, and just the literacy rates and stuff. So there's interesting things that, you know, in-person dialogue can facilitate. Good question. And uh, it's so great, but it's great and, and really exciting movement. I'm just interested in right. open access. Well, it, it, that's a great question. How does this address the digital divide? And uh, a couple things. First of all, as I, as I emphasized at the onset, we're not suggesting that this replace conventional feedback, which be, can be conducive to some of those marginalized communities. However, uh, there are a lot of these communities, they'll, they'll make a point of um, putting computers in public places like libraries. Um, they'll make a point of going out, integrating face-to-face -face feedback in their online platforms like Vallejo, which is you know, a mixed community. Um, and also, the, the um, topics are accessible through texting and, of course, smartphones. So almost everyone has a, a phone these days. And so that can help bridge the digital divide. See, any, any thoughts on having it translated in different languages? Oh, yeah. So uh, that's key. And so every page, for example, um, if I go to this topic here, let me just pick a different, I want to get out of that. Um, uh, this is Vallejo. And uh, I just want to simplify this quickly here. Let's just go to date. And then um, every page has at the bottom a, uh, a ability to convert using Google um, to uh, convert it to a different language. And so uh, that's, uh, so uh, the, the pages are, are convertible to different languages. Though, you know, I, I think because of this Internet connection, that Google iframe is not coming up in, the, um, in this demo right here. But uh, every page is... is, is um, uh, translatable into like, uh, what, 30 languages in real time. Uh, uh, really great presentation, Mike, and thank you for doing it. Uh, as you know, I'm on the zoning board in Berkeley along with Prakash, who happens to be here. Good to see you, Prakash. And um, there's two questions I have about this. One is, how do you uh, reach out to the broad community so they know they can go there? Because I don't think most people in any city spend a lot of time going to the city website. They don't have reasons to. So how do you reach out? What, what, do you, what, what tools would you recommend? And then the second question is, how do you verify when someone puts in that they're living on X Street in your city and they're participating? Right. Those are my two questions. Two good questions. So first, um, uh, in terms of uh, outreach, so um, one of the things that the company does is um, – <laughs> Uh, a workshop on the best practices of increasing the quality as well as quantity of online civic engagement. And here are the uh, uh, 10 best practices here. And so, for example, even though this can be embedded in a city's website or in a standalone website, uh, there, there are some things that you can do to, to drive civic engagement. One is, first of all, have interesting topics. Um, having a great email list. Often people uh, learn about these new topics through an email. Like, for example, they're subscribing to the city, and an email has a link that, that connects them to the, um, to the portal. Uh, it, this also integrates with all the social media, so it goes up on Facebook uh, walls and Twitter feeds. Uh, there's uh, some, some cities um, mentioned in public meetings. Sausalito, California, put up a big banner in their downtown announcing their uh, online forum. So there's all kinds of ways to drive awareness on an on uh, overall level than on a topic-by-topic -topic level. And then on your second question, uh, oh, which, was, which is a huge area, so um, fraudulent participation. Uh, so let me just say that um, let me just uh, emphasize this for if I can go over this quickly here. Um, so uh, fraudulent influence. This is defined as um, in contrast to public hearings, which everyone can see each person speaking. Online feedback is at risk of undue influence by a single person or organization, which creates fraudulent registrations that post multiple comments in order to amplify their feedback. So uh, the way that we combat this is we have a, a battery of software and a registration process so that, for example, we, can, we authenticate um, registrants in, in four ways. We confirm their email address, geocode their street address to make sure it's valid. We monitor their IP address and also the browser cookie and, and there are a few other things that help us identify when someone's uh, trying to participate fraudulently in ways that can game the system. You can maybe you know, add one more comment, but if you, you can't do it statistically, uh, in ways that we can't identify. And so, for example, <clears throat> this doesn't happen too often, but a matter of fact, it happened recently in Cupertino. And um, I don't know if I have time to show this, but um, you can just see how the um, online tools uh, can allow you to, you and the community, to expose this. Uh, maybe if I have a few more minutes. Uh, um, there's a lot of questions out here. I'm going to uh, uh, go ahead right there, and I'll come back to this. Let's see. 
Great presentation, Mike. Really enjoyed it. Um, activists don't call their work undue influence. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they call it influence. Yeah, right. Yeah. After all, politi- <laughs> politics depends upon influence. We'd be lost without it. Yeah. Is the site making value judgments? Not this is a great and sec- point. And second point, mm-hmm. City of Del Mar, California, got sued because some of the material in their engagement started pretending like a vote was treated that way and violated election law. Comments? Right. Yeah, so um, uh, first, um, on the activist influence, um, this in no way discriminates against activists. It it puts them on the same footing. Undo's a strong word. Uh, Only if someone tries to uh, uh, game the system or pack City Hall, which which, um, can happen. But the point is, you just want to be aware of that. This doesn't doesn't exclude them from doing it. It just exposes it in ways that you can... um, you can uh, manage. And so, for example, um, this is Cupertino. They just did a topic just this past week on um, uh, viewing uh, building heights in some of their nodes and gateways. They had over um, almost 1,000 people come online, over 393 people post feedback. I go to this topic <coughs> and go to the f- uh, feedback. <coughs> One of the things <coughs> in this, this survey, I haven't showed too many surveys in this, but um, you can see at the bottom that, wow, there's a lot of feedback from one IP address. So now you can now you can do some analysis. Look at this filter system here. This is by the way the public can do this as well as staff. It's completely transparent. So I'm going to go down and I'm going um, to and I'm going to uh, apply a filter to that um, that IP address address, and then I'm going to um, where is it? Uh, apply the filter. And now I can start to look at the feedback from people who are from that IP address and not. And then I can l- also look at it in other ways, the names, the, the uh, browser IDs. And you can t- see whether, is this a fraudulent person or is this the, the, the uh, analogy, analogy to packing City Hall with your friends or your activists? And so in this case, it looked like more of the latter. They, they all got together at a restaurant or a cafe and they all started uh, posting. But the point is, so at least you can expose it. So in no way does it... Um, uh, uh, Prevent those people from participating. And then your second question, was there a second uh, question? No. There may be utilization of this data oh, that yeah. violates state election law. Yeah, well, so everything, you know, we all over the user interface, there's there's information that says, this is, look at the bottom here, I don't know if you can read this. As with any, this is on every page, on, written and an, uh, as with any public comment process, participation is voluntary. This response or record not necessarily representative of the community. Uh, or the whole population. They do not reflect opinions of the government. And furthermore, you'll never see on one of these forums the V word, the word vote. Because not only is that inappropriate, but it gives people the expectation that this is a vote, it's like a referendum, and it doesn't matter what elected officials or, uh, or staff feel. And so that's how we do it. Uh, we don't yeah, have time. Yeah. Because I, I love to see all this. This is one of the most lively set of questioning that I've seen in these types of things. Yeah. So many aspects of this, it's amazing. Um, and I, I, I think it's extremely important. So I don't want to cut off the, the discussion, but just for the purpose of Citrus, um, we do have to end the, the, pop, the, the, the webcast right now. We want to continue some, some questions. So why don't we do this? If it's okay to stay in the room for a little bit longer? Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll let that happen. And then also we can follow up and maybe you can post your um, email and contact information for the students and others who might want to come and work or volunteer all right. could, uh, could be involved as well. Great. Okay, great. Okay, yeah. great. Thank you all. Thanks, Ken. Uh, yeah, thanks. I'll, I'll just take questions. Well, um, okay, I'll, I'll stay for a little longer in the open questions, right in the middle. Go ahead. Green. Who teaches the public to use the system? Who teaches the public to use the system? Well, uh, we try to make the system very user-friendly so it's intuitive, just like... Um, uh, and, 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 uh, and that's... And also, um, one of the things, the ways to offload government staff is... Um, the companies that, that help desk. So when people have questions about passwords or things, they send email to the company, and that offloads government staff from being overwhelmed. Uh, go ahead, green and red in the middle here. Um, well, first of all, I want to point out that um, we've got 50 people using one computer in the public library that's unlimited. That's that made look to you like unlimited access. Yeah. Um, but it's not that simple. Um, and I think that's a 
Well, that's why we take it to another level and make sure that it's. And you, also, you can tell when the two spouses are participating. You can look at their comments right. and see that they're, 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 you know, there's not an animosity. But, um, also, I mean, there are a lot of pitfalls that concern me, but that's for another talk. Um, mm -hmm. so my main concern is you keep talking about how important it is to have a good The only uh, evidence we have is through the user survey results. O across the entire network, about 50,000 comments, uh, about 93% of the people say they like using the service and they but find they it. They don't say, I trust my government. Right. It's just, a, it's just competency and quality. Uh, right here. Um, can you speak a little more about key activity <coughs> and the batch upload? Because right. I think that's a Right, so this, uh, not only is the kiosk mode interesting because it's driving this whole new um, trend towards integration face-to-face, -face. it just, what it allows you to do is basically use a public computer to get the feedback and then allow them to register and insert their private information at their convenience on their own computer at home or at work. Uh, but we also, now there's another mode called workshop mode. And this is going to allow people to participate uh, in, in commissions or workshops. And I don't know if you've ever been to a, uh, one of these workshops where they use a clicker. I mean, that's, that's technology from the previous century. Now people can use their phones to go to participate in these big workshops, and you see all the feedback in real time, and that's uh, called workshop mode. Other uh, comments or questions? Uh, back in the back there. Uh, governors or just elected officials and, and uh, uh, government leaders? Well, well one, yeah, well, uh, governments pay for this service, so by definition they're interested in using it. And we also, uh, there's also a place on it where it shows who's listening. And that also, you know, makes people aware of that and it helps to close the loop and everything. So that's one of the ways we help drive that in uh, ways that help. Are there any other uh, questions right here in the front? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so, th actually, this is a, a true question. It might go beyond the, the scope of this topic. But, you know, there's, over the last several years, there's a lot of people and organizations that have dabbled in online civic engagement and in um, crowdsourcing of government. And uh, a lot of them just come and gone. Uh, and so there is really, you know why? Because they didn't, we feel like this company had a, a kind of a business strategy that was sustainable. And uh, part of it is, again, focusing just on governments and on the unique needs of governments, uh, not uh, selling user data, uh, and not uh, making this like a Facebook, which is very useful for activists. And so by doing that, um, there, there's no one else out there that's, that's doing online civic engagement in ways that increase public trust in government. But there are a lot of crowdsourcing tools. Uh, I have a question right here. So this, this Housing communities, right. universities, corporations, which exercise governmental powers mm -hmm. to a limited degree over the people. Right. Their well, first of all, a lot of government agencies that aren't just municipalities use the service. Um, like, for example, the Utah Transportation Authority, even the, the um, Sonoma uh, County Transportation Authority. So they're not just all municipalities. But um, this relates to the, the previous question about business model. Uh, we try to... to um, make the, per the service optimized for the unique needs of government, not non-governmental agencies, not civic organizations. And so when th those people contact us, uh, they, we say well, it's not a good fit. And by the way, those organizations don't have a lot of money. Uh, and so, it's, again, it's not a great business model to sell to civic organizations. And, and so, it's, again, it's part of the focus and the separation uh, of, uh, of the company. Uh, so I think we'll uh, – one last question here? Or?
first we just know that, um, sorry, for my English, um, it acknowledged, to acknowledge voices, it yeah. helps, which is the, the government <laughs> yeah, I understand what you're saying. So again, this is part of a process. Now, this is w one piece of a solution. It may, it may, it's a growing piece, but um, again, a lot of this has to do with competency. And this is a, you know, this is an early stage of online civic engagement. And so, if you think over the next several years, the learning curve is going to really grow. And there's some cities that are on the leading edge. Like for example, you go to Salt Lake City. They have won numerous awards for uh, uh, transparency, accountability, and um, and outreach. Because they've been using this service for over half a decade across all their departments. And they've really learned and climbed the learning curve. They have all kinds of uh, best practices and things. So that it's just a process, a learning curve. And um, I'll take the one last question. Okay. So um, it looks like a major benefit of this for governments is improving the decision making made by administrators and elected officials. How do you measure that? What, what, what data do you have about the degree to which this has improved the decision making? Well, uh, it's true. There's no formal research, but there's a lot of anecdotal evidence. And I'll, I'll leave you with one <laughs> example right here in the city of Berkeley. In the uh, year 2009, the Peace and Justice Commission put on the city council agenda a proposal to declare the Marine Recruiting Center in downtown Berkeley an unwanted intruder. I don't know if anyone remembers that public hearing. It was a marathon public hearing, attracted people from all over the Bay Area, and the city of Berkeley approved it. Global news attention as well. Yeah, it was on uh, the Colbert Report or you know, John Stewart. And, um, <clears throat> and then a couple weeks later, the city had to rescind it because all of a sudden feedback from the community, the residents, the businesses said, you know, no matter what you feel about the, the, the mar Marines, they have a right to be there, and maybe the city should focus on fixing roads and public safety, and so they had to rescind that. And then fast forward to 2011, <clears throat> the, the city put on the, um, the city council agenda a decision to, um, to repatriate some Guantanamo detainees in Berkeley. Uh, but this time, some city council members put on the, uh, an online forum that topic. Uh, you can see here, uh, support the resettlement of one or two Guantanamo detainees in Berkeley. I go to that topic. And uh, let's see if this is an old topic. Let's see if it comes up. And go to the positions. You can see that not only was the overall uh, feedback against that proposal, but if you looked in the maps, uh, all the districts, all the voting districts were against it. So the city council now had this feedback in advance of the public hearing. And again, the public hearing was um, overflowing and um, was very positive in favor of this proposal. But this time the city council had the political fortitude to say, no, that's not necessarily representative of the community. We have other feedback, and they didn't uh, agree with this proposal. So that's just uh, kind of an anecdotal evidence, again, of how the online forum can lower, uh, can lower barriers to participation, bring out moderate voices, and give the decision makers more feedback to make better decisions. And I'll leave on that uh, note.